Welcome to Ahkam SOS, the show that discusses Islamic duties and practices for Muslims in accordance with the gruelings of His Eminence, the Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Salik Shirazi. I am Mohsin Shah and joining me is Sheikh Ali Ma'ar. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Mashallah, it's good to see you. Sheikh, we've been discussing Maqam al Musalli and where we should pray, where we should not pray. Let's carry on our discussion. Because last time you were mentioning about praying in the mosque and you, di you discussed you know, how much more greater thawab there is. We also discussed how uh, women who observe the correct hijab should be encouraged to go to the mosque and pray in jama'ah. What I wanted to ask you, Sheikh, was what if we're in the mosque and we're praying and we see some najasa? I mean, uh, uh, can we ignore it? Do we have to clean it up straight away? Is the masjid actually allowed to become najis? أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وعليه الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد With regard to the role of making the masjid and rendering it najis well it's haram to make masjid and the mosque najis and that applies to the interior of the masjid so the walls, uh, the ceiling, the roof, um, whatever belongs to the masjid, you cannot make it najis. And the said also goes beyond, and he says, as obligatory precaution, ihtiyat uh, wujubi, it is also not allowed to uh, make the exterior and the outside of the masjid uh, najis. For example, the, the outside door mm -hmm. um, and, and the wall, uh, you're not allowed to make it najis. And if someone observed the najasa and saw the najasa, let's say a, a child um, had a nosebleed, for example, and he just left the masjid with the najasa, that person must uh, immediately go and either inform those who uh, take care of the masjid to come and to wash and to make that uh, spot tahir and pure, or himself to bring something uh, and some water and a sponge, for example, or, or, or a towel to uh, make that spot tahir and najis. You cannot leave the masjid uh, najis and then you just go to and pray and ignoring this najasa. Mm -hmm. uh, the masjid and the mosque must be one of the cleanest, uh, best places for worship and gathering. And we have to refrain it from all types of najasa, all types of uh, you know, bad smells, bad looking. We try to keep the masjid as nice as possible and attractive. Because the whole idea is to attract more worshippers to come and pray and then leave. So we have to take care of the masjid as much as we can. Ahsan Sheikh. Um, in terms of uh, maqam and musalli and in terms of a place of worship, is it okay for me to, um, you know, board a train or a plane, a ship, any form of transportation? Um, and if I know that I won't be able to pray on that, is it okay for me to go to travel on it? What are you, you're allowed to pray on board, on the train, the plane, as long as um, you cannot make the time because by the time you arrive to the destination, the sun will be rising or setting. So you cannot wait and do the qada. You must pray in time, inside the time. And you pray as ada. You pray as uh, inside the time. So you have to make sure that you pray inside the plane, airplane or the train or the bus, um, as best as you can. If you can stand up and pray, let's say, in the, uh, the back kitchen of the airplane, they give you permission to do so, and you, you stand up upright, and you pray towards the Qibla, um, and you pray normally, or course to do everything, otherwise on the seat, for example. So you have to do your best to achieve and fulfill the conditions of uh, praying. So that's important. But I think it would be better if you, if you can 
stop off somewhere. You know, if you're on a coach, maybe a service station, or if you're on a train, maybe at one of the stations, stop. Perform your salah over there and then get back on your journey. This would be better, no? Of course, if the driver accepts and he stops, let's say, for, for a break, for a 10 minutes break, then you have this 10 minutes to straight away do wudu if, if, if you don't have the wudu and start praying, especially if it's if you're traveler, then it's uh, qasr. qasr. Yes, so you take advantage. You take that advantage of praying qasr and shortening the prayer and then you go back to the bus or the train. That's it. Sheikh, what about other religious places? For example, am I allowed to actually pray my salah in a, in a church or a synagogue? Yes, it's permissible. You're allowed to pray in churches, synagogues, and other places of worship, but with the consent of the owners. That's important, uh, that you have to get the consent. If they allow you to uh, pray, that's fine. Khalas, you pray there, you find a clean place and you pray. However, if that place or that uh, praying let's say you go to pray with few people jama'ah for example and they took f photographs or they filmed you for example if that propagates for them uh, their own belief or their own location and that promotes their religion now becomes haram so that's different okay. story so you've okay. got different sides uh -huh. if it's just a pray that's fine you pray or with their consent that's fine but if it promotes their belief, ideologies, their place, then that moves towards the haram, which in which you cannot go and pray there. So there, there's, um, you have to be very careful in terms of when you pray at these places to not promote and encourage their belief, but in turn, try and promote and encourage your own exactly. religion exactly. In, in these places. MashaAllah, exactly. Sheikh. MashaAllah. Exactly. Um, Sheikh, now, we discussed a little bit about women praying uh, you know, next to men. Is it allowed for a woman to pray uh, alongside a man uh, with no gap? And what about if, if they're in front? Is that allowed? Is that acceptable? Well, as I've mentioned previously that uh, with regard to other ulama, uh, they have the issue of making the salah batil if they pray close to each other. Um, however, the Sayyid says it's makruh. If a, if a woman prays next to a man, or ahead of a man. That's makruh, that's, that will make the salah batil. Mm -hmm. However, with regard to salat al-jama'ah, she must be uh, in the back uh, of, okay. of the, uh, the jama'ah men, and she is not allowed to pray in the front of the men in the jama'ah salah. So that's important. Otherwise, for the sake it's makruh, uh, for a man to stand next to a woman and pray. Although the praying is, 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 is a furada, and yes. it's separate, it's not jama'ah. But to make such clothes, uh, the say it's makruh. But you can, in overall. Sheikh, what does the Sayyid say in regards to uh, public buildings? For example, schools, colleges, universities, um, government buildings and places like that. Are we allowed to pray salah there? Yes, the public uh, places, as I've mentioned previously, it is allowed. So you can pray in these places. Um, again, you have to find a peaceful, a quiet place, away from the crowds. I mean, Tahir, to be Tahir. If all the conditions of Salah is met, that's fine, you can pray. MashaAllah. Shaykh, I want you to uh, try and imagine this scenario with me. Imagine we're on a plane, and uh, let's say we're going to Karbla for Ziyarah, me and you, Shaykh. Uh, and we're on an airline, and we need to pray Salah. But the cabin crew are restricting us from actually getting out of our seats and praying in the aisle or if there's some space at the back, they say, no, you're not allowed or if health and safety issues. Uh, plus, we're working, you're, you're going to be causing inconvenience. We're not, uh, we're not going to allow you to pray um, in, in the aisle or, or at the back. What do we do in that situation? What, what can we do, me and you? Well, if there is enough time when you get to the destination, where you can pray the salah there without becoming qada, then that's fine. You just wait. You delay, you delay your salah for a few hours. You arrive in destination, you pray there the salah. Otherwise, if it is out of the time and it becomes qada, then you have to pray in the airplane or the train or the bus in the best way you can. So on the seat, if there is space, you can stand up, upright, pray, and then you go back to the seat, for example. 
Otherwise, you just sit in, this, in, in your seat and pray. So you, you do your best. You try to observe the rules and the um, conditions of the salah, the rakur, the sujood, as much as you can. Otherwise, you just pray as, as much as you can and, and to um, perform the salah, which is the most important, number one, in time, and, no, and number two, with the all conditions, as much as you can. Asan Shekhar, thank you very much. And I think that's what concludes um, our um, discussion on, on the places of um, uh, praying. And the next topic that Sayyid say discusses is uh, Adhan and Aqama. So Adhan and Aqama, is this uh, wajib and mandatory in, in Salah? With regard to the Adhan and Aqama, in overall, the Adhan and the Aqama is mustahab and desirable act before the Salah. And they are very encouraged, especially the Iqamah, that you first do the Adhan and then the Iqamah, and then you start your prayers. However, if you decided to read the Adhan and Iqamah before the Salah, you're not allowed to uh, perform the Iqamah before the Adhan. Okay. You have to follow the sequence, although they are, they are um, mustahab, but you have to respect and follow the rules of uh, the sequence. So you make sure that you start with the Adhan first, and then you go to the Iqamah. You cannot start Iqamah first and then you go to the Adhan. That's wrong, that's not accepted. You, f you begin with the Adhan, and then you, you begin with the uh, Iqamah afterwards, and then you start uh, the Salah with the Takbir al ihram and you enter the Salah. Shaykh, you said that the Adhan and Iqamah is mustahab, it's not wajib. Can I just do the Adhan and leave the Aqama? Is that okay? Or leave the Adhan and just recite the Aqama? Um, as I've mentioned, these are both mustahab, but it is important that, um, that we try to do these mustahabbat. We get more rewards. At the end of the day, uh, we, we need rewards and thawab. So you can begin the Salah with the Aqama, that's fine. Um, but however, it's, you know, encourages for most astihbab that you try to bring the adhan or there's somebody else in, in the house or in the mosque who does the adhan and you listen to the adhan, that's fine. You just do the iqamah and you start to pray. Okay, Shaykhna, what about, you know, sometimes we see people, they have recorded adhan and recorded aqama. Is that permissible? Can, are we allowed to play uh, audios, uh, MP3s or CDs of Adhan and Aqama, is that acceptable? Well, um, to play Adhan or, or the Iqama on a tape or, or record the MP3, for example, without somebody uttering that Adhan as a live Adhan, the state states that they are deemed to have no value. Mm. It has to be a live uh, Adhan and Aqama. That's important. So it should be recited in with the presence of the reciter, exactly. not that exactly. it's been recorded and you can press, a, mm -hmm. press play. And what about um, standing or sitting during the uh, Adhan? The, the one who is reciting the Adhan and the Aqama, is it okay for him to do it sitting down or is it better for him to stand? It is allowed for the one to sit down and to recite the Adhan and Aqama, but it's better for them um, to perform the Adhan and Iqama while standing, that's mustahab. So it's better. Um, what about the Iqama? How does that differ from the Adhan? Uh, what's the difference between Adhan and Iqama? It's almost similar. It's just that uh, instead of saying Allahu Akbar in the beginning four times, in the Iqama you say it twice. Okay. And everything is twice said up to Hayya ala khayr al amal. Okay. You add again twice. قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة. Okay, so it's the same. Uh, we're, we're reciting the same dhikr, the exactly. same the same set, uh, words we recite. Exactly. Except at the beginning, Allahu Akbar twice. Exactly. Then we go through the same. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. All that twice, all the way until haya ala khair al amal, and then there's an addition yes. to the iqama, which is قد قامت الصلاة. قد قامت الصلاة. Twice. Twice. Yes. And then Allahu Akbar twice. And Again. La ilaha illallah twice. Allah Akbar is twice, but La ilaha illallah is just once. Okay, okay. So you end it once only. 
And that's it. You can now begin and commence your salah by saying the takbirat al-haram. Okay, so and you enter the salah. Exactly. exactly. Shaykhna, a lot of people say, a lot of people, Shaykhna, a lot of scholars say that Ashadu Anna Alin Waliula is not part of the Adhan. Um, does Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi, may Allah prolong his life, does he also have this opinion? With regard to this Shahada Thalitha of the Imam, commander of, of faithful alayhi salam, um, some ulama say that it's not part of the adhan, but it's mustahab to say it and to mention it. The Sayyid came and even his elder brother, Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi rahmatullah alayhi, <laughs> that this part of the adhan, the shahada, the, the third shahada, ashhadu anna aliyan waliullah, is part of the adhan. Okay. So you cannot say the adhan without this shahada. MashaAllah. So you have the complete adhan, you must mention this shahada of the Imam being as vicegerent. Ascent, Shaykhna. Thank you very much for that. And thank you to all our viewers for joining us on this episode. Inshallah, you benefited greatly. Inshallah, we'll be seeing you soon on the next episode of Ahkam SOS. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Ah, ah, ah.